It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. The first mass trial in the case of the J-20 has begun. Some 200 people face charges for taking part in a protest on Inauguration Day against Donald Trump. Opening arguments were heard today in the case of six defendants who each face about 60 years. Chip Givens is policy and legislative counsel for defending rights and dissent. Welcome, Chip. You were there today at the trial. What happened? So the prosecution, as well as the attorneys for the six defendants, all gave their opening arguments. The prosecution, in their opening argument, first focused on these really sort of melodramatic stories about different individuals who were inside the Starbucks or the bread store when the windows were smashed. She started by telling this story about this person who owned a small business that was, um, I guess, the window was smashed. She wasn't actually there. Um, and she kept mentioning that all of these people went to work that day with this sort of this implication that the protesters, I guess, should have been at work. Um, but then she kept describing the protesters as being a sea of black mask. She had this argument that they all wore black in order to uh, be unidentifiable and that people would pop out of the protest, uh, attack parking meters or, or trash cans. She kept mentioning the trash cans were turned over. It's a very dramatic thing, I guess, in her mind. Um, and they, they, would, they would just jump back in the crowd. She mentioned that the police followed them for 33 minutes and 16 blocks and did nothing. She seemed to think that helped her case. But every time I heard, oh, the police did nothing, all I could think is, well, it must not have been that big of a deal, these trash cans being flown around if the police didn't feel the need to act. So at one point, she, she, she mentioned a particular police officer felt, felt powerless to do anything because the protesters had quote unquote weapons in the form of bricks and the police had nothing, I guess. I mean, that's a ridiculous assertion. Uh, the most interesting thing to me though, is that she said, uh, I'll be very clear, we don't believe any of the, we don't believe any of the defendants personally engaged in property destruction. So she's very straight off the bat that these people are on trial for property destruction they did not commit. They're on trial because in her mind, the anti-capitalist, anti-fascist bloc was a premeditated riot and that participation in it was unlawful and that everybody who showed up is, is, is guilty of a crime. And it got really bizarre because she kept acting like being a medic. There are two medics on trial, including a registered nurse, with something nefarious. She goes at one point, oh, these medics, they're not your first aid technician at a charity walk. Oh, no, they had tourniquets and gauze, as though the fact that the protest had medics at it, that there were legal observers, that there were jail solidarity, was all evidence of a premeditated riot. And her argument is that people plan from the very beginning to have a riot. They publicly advertise this riot because I guess in her mind, that's what you do. And they showed up and, and did this. And I thought the defense attorneys did a wonderful job at just debunking this case. Let me stop you there, Chip. Let me stop you there. Yes. There, the prosecutor acknowledged that, that, that she thinks that none of the defendants engaged in the property destruction that took place that day. So yes. how can they how can they be ch charged because they're part of a premeditated plot to destroy it's a conspiracy property? it's a conspiracy it's a conspiracy what, what, to commit what crime. What is for the conspiracy? Uh she claimed they all wore black, they all attended the protest, they all moved at the same time. There was a police infiltrator in the organizing meetings. One of the defendants, not one of the ones on trial this week, but one on trial uh, later on, went on a podcast and said it was a black block and his mother would like to be in a black block. Um, just stuff like that. Uh, with Alexi Wood, the journalist, her evidence is that he was made celebratory remarks and cheers, such as holy cow, on, on the um, live stream he was doing, which is just, I mean, it, it's very paper thin evidence. I mean, she would show these videos of like somebody bashing a parking meter with a rock and, you know, it looked sort of, okay, that's not very nice. But in the background, you could just see a normal march proceeding. And the defense actually said, you know, we're not going to show you just video snippets. We're going to show you a, a march, a video of the whole march leaving. And when you saw it, it was just a normal march. There was one person with a dog. There was one person who had like their, their leg was injured and up on a scooter. So clearly not a violent mob, a, a normal march, a handful of people, you know, broke some trash cans and a, and a parking meter. 
But beyond that, it was very clearly a, a protest based on the video I saw during opening evidence. So I, I don't see how the prosecution has, has a chance, but you know, I, I don't want to knock on wood. I mean, I'm surprised this case has gone this far. It's that weak. You never want to bet against the prosecution. In, uh, you never want to bet yeah. across the prosecution of the United States. No, yeah. they have a so, marvelous way of winning. Yes. So uh, meanwhile, you're about to say uh, what the defense uh, offered today. Sure. The defense offered, like I said, that video of, of the first protest. Um, most of the defense arguments were around the fact that this was a First, Am first Amendment protected march. Their clients did nothing other than participate in the march. They had no intent to engage in property destruction. They traveled here in some cases from out of state. Uh, with the medic, they talked about how she was a registered nurse who helps cancer patients and that she was there to help people and that being a medic is not nefarious. It's, it's actually quite good. So the defense argument was, and then some of the individual defense attorneys would point out, like every time someone mentions, you know, property destruction, listen for my defendant's name. They were very clear that property destruction did take place and that they thought it was bad, but that there, there was no evidence tying their client to it. Uh, one of the attorneys also showed evidence of police brutality, including a police officer knocking someone over, spraying people indiscriminately with pepper spray. Uh, one of the defense attorneys was implying that the um, lawyers, that, that the prosecution had charged them because the arrests were unlawful and that they knew if they had an unlawful arrest, the ACLU would sue them. The prosecutor objected to that and the objection was sustained. Uh, the defense also tried to suggest that one reason they may have brought protective gear like eye, uh, goggles and gas masks was because the alt-right and fascist um, could have attacked them, but the prosecution also objected to that as well. But I, I thought, I mean, I just thought looking at the totality of the evidence, I mean, you have video of what looks to me like a march, and then you have an admission by the prosecution that there was no property damage committed by these particular individuals. Uh, the other thing the defense had that I thought was very persuasive was they had a recording of from the police chief on the radio before the first act of vandalism was ever committed, talking about how they were going to kettle the march. They didn't use the word kettle, but they talked about corralling them and blocking them off. So it was very clear that the police intended before the first act of property damage was ever committed to engage in this mass arrest. Hmm. You know, Chip, I should qualify my previous statement. Uh, you should never bet against the prosecution in the U.S. unless the uh, defendants are powerful police people. Officer. Or, or a police, police officer. officer. Or representing yeah, yeah. I mean, that's these are, the most... These are, these are protesters who are protesting the powerful. So the odds are stacked against them. And on this front, as we wrap, let me ask you, um, this case has not getting, gotten very much media attention, uh, even though, as you mentioned, one of the, a few, a few of, the of the defendants, at least in this first trial, at least one of them, are journalists. Um, and no matter your feelings about property destruction, uh, 60 years in prison for some property destruction seems pretty excessive. Your thoughts on the uh, relative lack of attention that this case has gotten? The lack of attention has been really disappointing. I mean, I obviously have, have been on your program several times to talk about the case. Uh, the Nation has given me a platform. The Intercept has covered it. But the attention has been really uh, disappointingly light. I will say on the press freedom front, Defending Rights and Dissent was joined by a number of press freedom groups, including PEN America, Freedom of the Press Foundation, the Nation Institute, Free Press, in sending a letter to the prosecution calling on them to drop the charges against the journalist because of the press freedom issues. Uh, I think the New York Times wrote an article on Alexi Wood's case, but the coverage has not been very good. Well, we'll continue to cover it. And Chip, I know you'll be following this case closely, so we look Will forward be. to having you back on to discuss it. Thank you for having me, Aaron. It's always a pleasure. Chip Gibbons, Policy and Legislative Counsel for Defending Rights and Dissent. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.